So in this problem, we're trying to find a rate law given a table of experimental data. So the first thing we always want to do is write out a generic form of a rate law. So rate is equal to some constant k, and then we've got, in this case, iodine to some power, and argon to some power. Now it's up to us to use these data in the table above to find out what order each of these reactants is. The idea is we want to hone in on experiments where only one of the concentrations is changed and then see how that affects our overall rate. For example, between the first and second experiments, we can see here with the argon, between experiments one and two, the argon was held constant, which means that whatever change we observe in the rates between the two experiments is due solely to the change in the concentration of iodine. So let's see by what factor changing the iodine changed the rate. We can see here that the concentration was doubled. And when we doubled the concentration of iodine, the rate of the reaction actually went four times as fast. Wowzers! Okay, so that shows us there's an exponential relationship here. Since we doubled the concentration of iodine, and the rate went four times as fast. That means this must be second order, because two squared equals four. To figure out what order the reaction is in argon, let's compare experiments two and four. Because once again, we can see that we're holding the concentration of iodine constant. And between the two of these, we're actually quadrupling the concentration of argon. And when we quadruple the concentration of argon, we can see here that the rate also quadruples. It goes four times as fast. So that means we have a directly proportional relationship here. Okay, so to make the comparison, we made it four times as concentrated. It went four times as fast. Four to the first is going to get us four times as fast which means that this is first order with respect to argon. In this problem, we need to come up with an average rate of disappearance of a molecule A based on these two pictures here. So what we're going to do, a rate change is the change in concentration of something over the change in time. So the change in time we can already see. It went from zero seconds to 35 seconds, so our dt is equal to 35 seconds. Whoa, we're halfway there. Now, we need to find the change in the concentration of A to complete this problem. In the second panel, we see we have five spheres of A. In the first panel, we had 10 spheres of A. So if we do this, we see that our net change was negative 5 spheres of A. And the negative sign just means that it's disappearing by virtue of being a reactant. Now, let's translate this to a concentration because the problem tells us that each sphere of A represents 1 times 10 to the negative 2 molar of A, which means the net loss here was 5 times 10 to the negative 2 molar of A. Now we have our change in A and our change in time. All we have to do is combine the two. So our rate is going to be equal to 5 times 10 to the negative 2 molar of A divided by the elapsed time, 35 seconds. So we end up getting that the overall rate of change of A, the average rate of change of A during that time is 1.4 times 10 to the negative 3 molar per second. You'll note that I'm not including the negative here. Why is that? Well, rates are always reported as positive values. It's implied that the change is negative because it's the disappearance of A. So, our rate, though, has to be a positive number. So, there are two ways we can come up with a rate law. One is with a table of data, like we did before. The other is with a mechanism, a step-by-step breakdown of the elementary steps that occur during a reaction. 
So, let's see how we would do it for these three different proposed mechanisms. Remember, the most important step in determining how fast a reaction can go is the slow step. So a reaction can only proceed as fast as its slowest step. So it's also called the rate determining step, and we can build a rate law based off of this. So our rate is equal to some constant k times NOBR2, nobr, times the concentration of nitric oxide NO. So, we have a rate law, but is it a good rate law? No. No, it is not. Why is that? We have right here the presence of something that's made in one step and used in a subsequent step. We have an intermediate. Ah! Fear not. We can use a little bit of chemistry and a little bit of algebra to substitute that intermediate out, and that's exactly what we're going to do here. While the second step is slowly going and taking its good old time, the first step has a chance to reach a state called equilibrium, where the forward rate and the reverse rate are equal. And we're going to use that fact to substitute out the intermediate in our rate law. So we're just going to write a rate law for the forward reaction of step one. K sub F for forward, it's arbitrary, times NO times BR2. Now, we're going to set that equal to the rate of the reverse reaction. So if instead we were going this way, well, our rate law would look like this. K sub R, our arbitrary rate constant for the reverse reaction, times NOBR2. Now, we need to solve for our intermediate mathematically so we can substitute it out of our working rate law that we built in the previous step. How mathematically do we solve for it? Well, we divide both sides by k sub r. Any constant divided by itself is just 1. And a constant divided by a constant is just... Wham! A whole new constant! We don't care what it is. I'm going to call it k nu. Because it's arbitrary. And also, we knew that we had to replace the intermediate in our rate law. <laughs> now, since we've solved for our intermediate in terms of reactants, all we have to do is plug this in, substitute. So we're just going to take this in, plug it in for that. Well, I'm getting that our rate is equal to some constant, the 1k, uh, times another constant, the k nu. Again, it's just another constant. So we're just going to plug in k OBS for observed. Sometimes you'll see that. It doesn't matter. We're not solving for k here. It's just some rate constant for the reaction. Then we've got the NO and the BR2 that we plugged in times the NO that was already there in our rate law. So what we'll end up getting is NO squared, one second, we can clean this up a little bit, voila, times the BR2. So that is our rate law, and that's a good rate law. And is it consistent with the rate law we're given? Eh? That's still on this page? Whew. Yes, yes it is. So mechanism one matches. Now, we need to try again for mechanism 2 and 3. Ding! Now let's check mechanism 2 and see if it matches the rate law that we were given. Well, here we can see that our rate determining step is the uh, first step. Now, if that's the case, then you're in luck because there's no way an intermediate can react in the first step, which means you can just write a rate law based on it. Oh. So then we ask ourselves, does the rate law that we got with our mechanism match the rate law we're given up here? And the answer is no. No, it does not. So we can eliminate mechanism two. Now let's try mechanism three. Once, it, once again, we're going to hone in on the slow step, and we're going to our, write our rate law based on that. Once again, since we have an intermediate in our rate law that we get from our slow step, 
um, we need to go back and we need to substitute it out using chemistry and algebra. Remember that while the slow step is slowly going, the first step has a chance to reach equilibrium, which means that the forward rate kaboom, equals the reverse rate. Now we're going to solve for intermediate, so we're going to divide both sides by this k sub r, and again we're going to be making an arbitrary constant, so this is going to cancel out. Constant divided by a constant is just another constant. I'm going to call this k arb. The arb is for arbitrary. Now that we have that, we can take this and we can plug it in to our rate law and substitute out the intermediate. And we are left with a rate law that does indeed ding, match the rate law that we were given. So of these, which ones match the rate law above? It is one and three. In this problem, Rick T. Cat and his team of intrepid graduate students have invented a new element, nitnium. Ooh, neat. Okay, so we're told that it decays with a half-life of 409 seconds. Okay, um, what else are we given? Well, we want to find the amount of time T it'll take for it to go 87.5% uh, to completion, for that much of it to react, which means that we'd be left with 12.5% of the nitinium. So, um, whenever we want to find out, um, whenever we want to relate an initial amount, a final amount in the time it takes uh, for any nuclear decay problem, remember that we're going to employ our first order integrated rate law. Okay? And there's a few different flavors of the first order integrated rate law you can use. Really, either one will work. Um, so, you can either set the natural log of n sub t divided by n sub 0 equal to negative kt, or we can set it equal to negative 0.693 times time divided by half-life. Both work. I prefer to solve for k first, so that's what I'm going to do. Remember with first order kinetics that if you know either k or t, you can find the other one because they're directly related by this equation right here. So we'll divide 0 0.693 by 409 seconds, and we'll end up getting that k is equal to 1.69 times 10 to the negative third. And our units here are seconds to the negative 1. Okay, so now let's take a look at our integrated rate law. Remember that the ratio n sub t divided by n sub 0 represents our fraction of reactants remaining. So, since we know that we have 12.5% left, we can just plug in 0 0.125 in for that value. So we get the natural log of 0 0.125 equals negative k, 1.69 times 10 to the negative third, times t, the time that we're solving for. So the natural log of 0 0.125 is negative 2.08. So now we have... Um, this simplified out, and we just need to divide by k on both sides. So we'll divide both sides by negative k, and my apologies, I should have included units before. So remember our k is in seconds to the negative 1, sorry about that. And then once we do this, we will end up getting our time, which is about 1,230 seconds. This problem gives us a um, plot that graphs uh, binding energy per nucleon versus um, the atomic mass of the common isotopes of elements. So it should be noted, the greater the nuclear binding energy per nucleon, the stronger the nucleus, and the more stable the nucleus. So what this means, practically speaking, is that of all the common elemental isotopes out there, iron-56 is the most stable. So, now, let's take a look at these various true-false statements and see which ones are true. Before we do that, um, let's consider what 
unstable nuclei are just what nuclei in general can do to become more stable, to become more like iron. So for our heavier nuclei, in this case we have a, a few different isotopes of uranium represented over here, well what can they do to become more like iron, to increase stability? Well, these elements tend to undergo fission if there's some sort of um, nuclear bombardment with them. So um, what that means is the nucleus can blast apart and form smaller nuclei. And those smaller nuclei, um, as you can see as we work our way to lighter nuclei toward iron 56, um, the nuclear binding energy per nucleon increases, which means they get more stable. On the flip side, lighter nuclei can undergo fusion where the nuclei fuse together to become heavier to become more like iron. So the take home point is the favorable processes with respect to fission versus fusion for isotopes is fusion for elements lighter than iron and fission for elements heavier than iron. And in both cases, these are exothermic processes. Um, for example, fission is what's done in a nuclear reactor to um, help heat water to make the steam, etc., etc., etc. And fusion is what takes place actually inside sun, the sun and various other celestial bodies. So is fission of heavy nuclei an exothermic process? Indeed. Ding! That does release heat. Is fusion of lighter nuclei exothermic? Ding! Indeed, that also releases heat. And then finally it says iron 56 has one of the largest binding energies per nucleon of all elements. Well, we can see, looking at this graph, that that is indeed, ding, true. So all three of these are true. In this problem, we're carbon dating an artifact um, that's exhibiting 10.52 disintegrations per second as its activity from carbon-14. And we're told that the value for freshly cut wood is a cool 15.2 um, disintegrations per second. So, what does this mean? Well, all nuclear decay is first order. So, once again, we're going to be using our first order integrated rate law. Uh, that was supposed to be highlighting, not crossing it out. So, yet again, I'm going to use this relationship that the rate constant k is equal to 0.693 divided by half-life for first order kinetics. So we'll plug in our half-life of 5,715 years, and we will get k is equal to 1.21 times 10 to the negative fourth years to the negative one. Now we have everything we need to solve for time and figure out how old this artifact is. So let's plug things into our first order integrated rate law. So our n sub t is 10.2 disintegrations per second. Remember, activity is directly proportional to the amount of radioactive material in a sample. So using DPS is perfectly fine as long as we use it for both the n sub t and the n sub zero. And our initial activity is 15.2 disintegrations per second. Okay, so then we're going to set that equal to negative k times t. Now let's take the natural log and see what we get. This becomes negative 0 0.40, and then we're going to divide both sides by negative k. So there's our negative 1.21 times 10 to the negative fourth years to negative 1. Then we will get that t is equal to 3,297 years. So that means that our answer is going to be choice E. Graphs. Graphs are great. So, if we plot 1 divided by concentration versus time and we get our plot in a straight line, some linear data like this, what does that mean? Well, there's two important takeaways we can do from this. Um, first of all, is if we compare our second order integrated rate law to y equals mx plus b, we'll see that these uh, two equations, both the second order integrated rate law and the generic form, slope intercept form from linear algebra, match together very nicely. So, what's happening here? Well, let's assign each of these a part of the second order integrated rate law. So, if your data line up in a straight line, as these data do, when you plot 1 divided by concentration versus time, 
This means definitively that you can say that this reaction is second order. The other thing that we can get out of this is if we look at the slope of our plot, well, what do we see the slope is equal to if we check our y equals mx plus b? We can see here that the slope is equal to k, a very useful piece of information to glean out of a graph like this. So we know it's second order, and we know the value of k. So our k is 0 0.0131 molar to the negative 1 s to the negative 1, classic second order. Now we have everything we need, and we're trying to uh, figure out how long it would take to decompose half of this. Um, so um, there's two ways we can do it. We can either use the second order integrated rate law, or um, we can just use the definition of half-life for second order kinetics, which is half-life equals 1 divided by k a sub 0. Okay, so let's plug in and see what we get. So we have 1 divided by k a sub 0. Um, our molar are going to cancel out. Ah, I should have put the molar in here. That's going to cancel out. And uh, it turns out the amount of time that elapses is 2.35 times 10 to the third seconds. Our choice, A. So in this problem, we're plotting the natural log of concentration versus time, and we're getting a straight plot. Remember that if you see this, this means that you're definitively dealing with first order. The fact that I want us to focus on on this problem is, remember that the slope is equal to negative k. So what does that mean? It means the steeper the slope, the more negative the slope, the greater the value of k. Remember, the greater the value of k, that means the faster the reaction. So let's analyze these different options and see which ones hold true for these um, different runs of this experiment. So notice how runs 1 and 2 have equal slopes. What does that mean? Well, if their slopes are equal, that means that we can say that the k from experiment 1 is equal to the k from experiment 2. So what does this mean, practically speaking, for this reaction? So since it's the same reaction, if we're observing the same k, it must have been done at the same temperature because um, any given reaction has a given k at any given temperature. If you change k, um, if you heat things up, the k will get larger. So we've established that 1 and 2 must be at the same temperature. So what's the difference between these two runs? Well, the difference is, if you look at the initial concentrations, so the concentrations, the natural log of the concentrations at time zero, we can see those are different. So runs one and two must have been done at the same temperature, but with different concentrations. So what's the deal with runs two and three? Because we can see here they are most definitely showing a, um, a different slope, okay? So that means they must have been run at different temperatures. So if we look at this, which one has the more negative slope? Because the more negative slope means the larger the value of K, the faster reaction. Since reaction two has the steeper slope, that means that K2 is greater than K3, which means in terms of temperature, that T2 must have been greater than T3 because it afforded us the larger rate constant K. So which of these are true? Reactions 1 and 2 were done at the same temperature, check, because it's got the same value of K, but with different starting concentrations. Ooh, I like that one. That is indeed true. Choice 2. Reactions 2 and 3 were done at the same temperature, but with different starting concentrations. Well, no. I mean, the starting concentrations, actually, we can see here, the natural log of them are the same. Um, so this is false for multiple reasons. It also can't be the same temperature because reaction 2 was faster, so it must have been done at a higher temperature. So then finally, 3. Reaction 2 was done at a lower temperature than reaction 3. Lower? Ha ha ha! I should think not. Reaction 2 was faster, therefore it must have been done at a higher temperature temperature, which means that only one is correct. All right, the next two problems are a twofer. Um, it's BOGO for questions. Um, 
The first part deals with, or question 19 rather, deals with um, what's a catalyst and what's an intermediate. So what's the definition here? So an intermediate is literally something that exists in a reaction for an intermediate amount of time. It's made in one step and then used in a subsequent step. So let's see if anything foots that proverbial bill here. The OI minus was made in the first step, but then used up in the second step. So it was literally there for an intermediate amount of time. It's made and then used up. So that must be an intermediate. Same thing with HOI. So we can see here that um, the HOI is formed in the second step and then subsequently used in the third step. So from the looks of it, we've got ourselves two different intermediates. OI minus and HOI. A catalyst is an anti-intermediate. It's something that is used up, but then later um, is reformed in a subsequent step. And then once it's reformed, it can facilitate the earlier reaction, and it can be made again, and can keep going. Um, there's no such catalyst in this particular reaction, uh, only reactants, intermediates, and products. So which of these are true? Um, well, it's choice B. OI minus and HOI are intermediates. On to question 20. This one is about rate laws again. What's really nice about this particular problem is if we look, we can see here that step one is the slow step. If step one is the slow step, really, there's only one thing we need to do to answer a problem like this. Write a rate law based on the reactants. Remember, anything reacting in the first step can't be an intermediate because an intermediate needs to be generated um, previously to that step, and you can't have a previous step to the first step. So all we need to do is write a rate law based off of this first slow step. So rate is equal to, classic, some constant K, H2O2, times I minus N. Oh, there we have our rate law. And it's a good rate law. doesn't have any intermediates in it. It's good to go. Ah, nope, 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 nope. Sorry, sorry. Rescinded, rescinded. There we go.